Hi guys, welcome to Cryptids Canada. I hope everybody is having a great day so far. Huh. So, quick update before I get started. Um, I didn't make it up north. I made it halfway to look at a couple of apartments, which wasn't the plan necessarily, but uh, it was a no-go anyways. So, my house closes in January. As I've been mentioning, I didn't really want to look for another house in the winter because you know what? In the wintertime, everything is beautiful. It's fresh and crystal clean. But as soon as the snow melts, it's like green acres, you know, like that's the last thing I need. So I thought, well, I'll have to move somewhere. So I might as well move north into the general vicinity. And that way, when the snow starts to melt, I can really start seriously looking for my forever property. Well, so now it's basically trying to find an apartment where 99% of the people that rent anything are catering to, you know, the city dwellers that want to get away for a week or the weekend to cottage country. Huh, so that's what I'm up against. People close their cottages at the end of October, November, and they don't reopen them until uh, May, I think. So now it's basically trying to find somebody who's willing to keep their cottage or home open for the winter time. So anyways, I didn't have much luck. So um, before I get started, I want to remind you... Um, so there's these rules and regulations that, you know, as YouTubers, we have to be careful not to cross the line because they will basically, you know, stop your video or demonetize your video. So the point is that I wanted to remind you guys um, of a video that I did back, oh my gosh, uh, eight months ago. It was titled uh, The Story of Tommy C. Eugene. Uh, Bigfoot saved a child from drowning. Basically, it was his story. He wrote a book and it was called The Agony of One Child's Weeping. I did two stories on that, episode 156 and 183. So if you guys will remember, I had to be really careful how I worded everything because, you know, you cross that line and, and it's they just either take the video down or you have to redo it. And, I don't want to do that. So I want to warn you guys ahead of time. The story I received is similar to that one. It's uh, heart-wrenching. And um, so what I'm saying is I have to be careful how I word things. So you may have to read between the lines a little bit. Oh my gosh, guys, you're not going to believe what I just noticed. I am at 14,977 subscribers. Isn't that amazing? I am 23 subscribers away from 15,000 subscribers. Oh my word. I can't even believe that I got to 15. Uh, not yet. I'm getting to 15,000 subscribers. Oh my gosh. I'm so excited. Okay. Now... No more jibber-jabber. On with the story. Okay, uh, this one is called We Were Saved by Three Bigfoot. Okay, uh, dear Miss Cryptids Canada, this story involved me and my brother, both of us now in counseling together, and our counselor feels it would benefit us to speak to you openly about our story. At first, she wasn't sure until she heard the compassion in which you tell other people's stories. The fear was that we would regret speaking up and be at the mercy of the doubters and haters and possibly make us regress in our therapy. I'm going to keep our real names private because we have families that could become affected by this. My brother and I are identical twins and you can call us Jim and Jeff. I, Jim, will be writing the story. We were born in the mid-50s in Northern California. Our mother was a devoted homemaker and our father owned a car dealership. In the early 60s, my father was in a car accident that left him 
badly injured. Mom tried to run the business while Dad was in the hospital and then at home recuperating. Our mother discovered that our father was up to no good in many of his business and personal practices, and pretty soon the bank took our house and the stock that was left at the car lot. We were only seven at the time, but later we would learn that our dad squandered all of the money on hookers and an illegitimate child that none of us knew about. After losing the house, we had no choice but to move in with our grandfather, my father's dad. Our grandfather was as mean and nasty as they come, but he adored his son while hating our mother with a terrible vengeance. We later discovered it was because she denied his drunken advances. Our wholesome and loving clean environment was flipped upside down when we lost our house and moved in with Grandpa. Dad began drinking with his father while Mom struggled to turn this filthy, run-down old house that stank like urine into a bearable place to live. It was a farm at one time, and all that grew there now was hatred and rusted-out old cars. Dad started berating Mom, like his father did, and every night it was a huge fight until Mom couldn't take it anymore, and she screamed at Dad that he was a no-good cheater like his father. Dad hauled off and hit her many times and until she was unconscious. Later that night, we were woken up by our mother, who told us how much she loved us and that she had to leave to look for another place for us boys to live. She said it wasn't safe anymore. We cried and begged her to take us with her, but she said we would be safer with our father because he loved us and would look after us. And then she left. We didn't see her for a long time after that night. Dad said she was dead and we believed him because she never came back like she promised. We were sad, broken little boys after that. Dad also became more of a drunk and the slapping and yelling began. He never hit us until after Mom left. We remembered the first time that Dad hit Jeff in the eye with a shoe. He kept Jeff home from school for almost two weeks. The next five years were awful and just got worse and worse. The broken bones and bruises were well noticed by our school teachers and nothing was done. Then, one day on our 13th birthday, of course, there was no gifts or birthday cake, but there was a card in the mailbox that I got after getting off the bus. I always picked up the mail because Grandpa wasn't able to get down the driveway. It was a card and it was addressed to us. It was from our mother. She wasn't dead. Jeff and I literally cried tears of joy. She included a phone number begging us to call her. So we folded up the card and put it in Jeff's notebook. We were going to make an excuse the next day at school and use the phone to call her. When we walked in the door, Grandpa was standing there, and he started yelling at us to give him his mail. He accused us of trying to steal his mail, and then Dad walked in. They literally teamed up against us. We had no choice, so we gave him the card. We were kicking ourselves for not remembering her number. As the night got later, the abuse got worse and worse. It had never been so bad. Dad was going after Jeff the worse, and I couldn't stand it anymore, so I defended Jeff, and we made a run for it, took off in Dad's car. We knew he always left the keys in the car. Honestly, we had no idea what we were doing. We drove that car about five miles an hour down the dirt road and then turned down a driveway that was no longer being used. The house was almost leveled, so we knew we were safe and pulled around to the backyard. It was almost a full moon, so we could see around pretty good. If Dad or Grandpa showed up, we would split for the woods. We knew we would never go back after the abuse we suffered that night mother or no mother. We were so exhausted by all the events that we just fell right to sleep in the front seat. At this point, the memories become somewhat blurried, but 
What we do remember, beyond a shadow of a doubt, is this. Jeff said he woke up because he had to use the bathroom. He was just getting ready to open the door when he saw something very large standing in the shadows, and it seemed to be coming out of the woods. The woods were about 200 yards from the car, and the uncut grass surrounding the car was about four feet tall. The creatures were towering over that grass. He reached over to me and he squeezed my hand. I was about to answer angrily when Jeff said, Jim, shh. I opened my eyes because of the alarm in his voice. He whispered, Jim, there's something in the woods. I looked and I didn't see anything. Go back to sleep, Jeff. You just had a bad dream, I said. I went back to sleep and woke up to Jeff saying, Jim, open your eyes. I opened my eyes and looked at Jeff. What? I said. And then I saw what looked like a monster man looking in the window at Jeff. And then with its big black round eyes, it looked over at me. Out of my peripheral vision, I saw a dark mass out the front of the window and then out the side of my window. I looked directly at the being beside me, and the black eyes looked back at me. The one thing that was missing was imminent danger. We felt nervous of the unknown only. The female directly in front of us held out some dirty roots, we believed, and she set them on the hood of the car and stepped back. Jeff and I both heard in our heads that we were safe and welcome. I asked Jeff if he heard what I heard, and he answered yes. We both started crying. It was the first time in six years that we actually believed it. The creature beside Jeff was kneeling down like the one beside me on its knees, and the tops of their heads were still taller than the roof of the car. It touched the glass with the palm of its hand and then slowly closed its eyes. Then we heard, bad men will come. We looked at each other in fear. Then the one beside me said, we will make you safe. They all stood up and went to the front of the car and seemed to be waiting on us. I looked at Jeff and he said, we should go. If dad's coming, then I don't want to be here, I said. We got out of the car slowly. The one who had offered us roots reached out for Jeff's hand and then reached for mine. We started walking, and I turned around after about ten steps, and the two big ones were standing at Dad's car. And that's when we saw the lights coming down the driveway. We got to the tree line and turned around again in time to see the two big ones run at Grandpa's truck at full speed. Grandpa's truck stopped, but before the truck could back up, the big ones slammed into the hood, making sounds that we had never, ever heard before. We actually had to cover our ears. It was so loud. Then we were turned around and led further into the woods. We walked for what seemed like hours and miles, Finally, we came to a clearing that was lit up by the moon. The female Bigfoot kneeled in front of Jeff and cooed as she felt his cuts. She looked at me sadly, clearly realizing that I was nowhere as bad as my brother. She stood up and watched the ground, and periodically she reached down and yanked up some weeds, putting them in her mouth. When she had a mouthful, she came back and kneeled in front of Jeff again and took a pinch of the chewed weeds out of her mouth and gently wiped the dried blood off his face. Then she sat cross-legged and patted the earth on either side, as if directing us to lay down and put our heads in her lap. I watched as she chewed green weeds from her mouth and spread them all over Jeff's wounds. Jeff fell asleep in seconds, and I fell soon after. We woke up to the sun beating down on us, and we were all alone. We stood up, and we saw a house about ten feet through the woods. 
We started walking towards it and we were stunned when a woman came out carrying a laundry basket. She saw us and dropped the basket. She asked, whatever happened to you? We told her the story about our father and grandfather, but we left out the part about the Bigfoot. But we still saw her scan the woods like she expected to see something. We went inside and she called the police. We told the police everything about our father and how we left. We told them what little we knew about our mother and within an hour, Mom was at the police station. Mom took us to Vancouver, Washington after that and Dad and Grandpa were given a strict talking to by the judge and told to leave us and our mother alone. Later, as we got older, Mom would tell us that Dad threatened her and had two women threatened to beat her to death if she ever came around us. Mom sadly got into drugs for several years until she got some help and reached out to us on our 13th birthday. Jeff and I just instinctively kept quiet about everything. We never even spoke to each other about it till the show Funding Bigfoot started. When I heard the advertisements for it, my blood felt cold. Jeff said he had a similar experience until we finally spoke about it. There was literally nothing negative about our experience. Nothing. But it took over our thoughts day and night until we felt no choice but to seek out counseling. We saw her together and she believed us immediately because she too had an experience when she was a child. Once we accepted what had happened and that it was real, it was a loving and beautiful experience. We were able to stop fearing it and even feel some pride over it. We spent hours listening to all the various channels separately and then later discussing the interesting stories. I remember Jeff and I having lunch and Jeff told me about this channel he discovered. He said he had a sweet, calm feeling after every story. There was something about the way this lady spoke about people's encounters that made him want to tell our story too. He told me to go listen to Cryptids Canada when I got home and let him know what I thought. Sorry about laughing, you guys. I just thought that was so sweet. Anyways, well, needless to say, I felt the same way. So we spoke to our therapist and she too thought it would be a good idea to speak about our experience. So here we are. I know this is a long story, so you can cut it down wherever you see fit. We trust your ability to tell an encounter. Before I finish, I just wanted to tell you about our memories from the Bigfoot that night. There was a mild, unpleasant odor, but nothing like it's typically spoken about. The female's hands were at least three to four times bigger than our hands. They were hard and very coarse, calloused like she worked hard her whole life. And when she was clearing off Jeff's face with the chewed weeds, you could see the sadness and pain in her eyes, just like a mother soothing a child. I believe the weeds she put on Jeff's face were called plantain or pantain. It is amazing for healing and fighting infections, so I'm told. Her breasts were long and full and covered with black hair. Her hair was coarse and thick but not matted. It had a musty odor but not completely offensive, much like a B.O. from working in the sun all day. She also took very loud, long breaths. And I realized all of this while we were in therapy. Thank you for telling our story. Love, Jim and Jeff. Well, guys, um, you know, I have to say, sometimes I have to sit for, you know, five or ten minutes after I finish reading a story or even before while I'm reading the story because, I, you know, sometimes I get super emotional, um, especially when, when the kids are involved. Uh, this story, as well as uh, Tommy Eugene's story, really affect me. And um, I think, honestly, there's got to be something 
something to it that these beings are meant to step in where they can and help these kids because uh, this is, I can't even tell you how many stories that I've read or uh, heard of where this kind of thing has happened. Uh, I, I'm thankful that they are that kind of a creature for sure because we hear a lot of the good and the bad, right? But anyways, guys, you know I love you. Please be kind to each other, care for each other, and love each other. And most importantly, remember to love yourself. Okay, guys, please hit the like button, subscribe, and we'll see you back here in a couple of days. Bye for now.